All right. Um, hey, guys. Uh, I think I'm just going to get started here. Uh, first off, I just want to thank everyone for attending this session. I know it's like right after lunch on the last day, so appreciate you guys being here. Um, my name is Fenjin. Uh, I am a co-founder of a technology startup based in San Francisco called Imply. Um, also a committer on one of the open source projects uh, I'm going to be talking about today called Druid. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you guys about this idea of building an open source stack basically to handle streaming data, uh, which is the type of data you find very often uh, when working with IoT devices. And uh, what I hope to cover during this talk uh, is a little bit about the problems that you face with uh, high volumes of event data. And I want to talk about a couple of different technologies uh, designed to solve various problems when dealing with high volumes of uh, streaming data. And those pieces uh, consist of a message delivery piece, a data processing piece, and a, a piece to serve queries. So we start off with the problem. Uh, I'm sure by now you guys uh, are very familiar with the problem. Uh, there's connected devices. They are very growing very, very rapidly. You know, you can now tweet on your fridge so that people can know, the whole world can know what you're having for lunch or what you're grabbing for a snack. So that's, uh, that's kind of cool. But uh, connected devices are everywhere. They're, they're, starting to, they're continuing to grow in popularity. And as a result of that, data is growing very, very quickly as well. And I think uh, a lot of the, the, the problems people talk about uh, when, when talking about IoT in this entire space is that there's a ton of data that gets generated. And this data is often very, very valuable because when you extract insights from this data, there's important decisions or optimizations you can make. So the, the problems I want to focus on today is really just around collecting a, a massive stream of data and then making sense of it. Now, with any connected device, um, devices generally emit a stream of events. And these events are often called messages or logs, depending on how you read them in literature. But they're just really bits of information describing what's happening at, at a particular period in time. Uh, so when I look at uh, events emitted by devices, uh, I see them typically being composed of three components. So there's a timestamp indicating when the event was created. Um, there's a set of attributes around this event. So these are properties that either describe the device, they describe what's happening on the device, or they, they describe something of interest. And then uh, as part of this event, there's a set of measurements, and these are the numbers of, of, of interest. And when we get a bunch of these events, uh, generally what we want to do is we want to calculate a variety of statistics based on the measurements. And when we calculate these statistics, we often want to group on the attributes or filter on the attributes. And by doing so, we, we obtain more insight onto the data. And once we achieve that insight, we can make decisions based on the findings. Um, so to give you an example of some of the analytics you can do off of a stream of data, I thought it'd be useful just to showcase a short example. And uh, for the example, I'm just going to be using uh, a UI here. And let's see if I can make this font a little bit bigger. Uh, I have a, a couple of different streaming data sets here. Uh, there's one for Wikipedia, just edits that are occurring on Wikipedia. Uh, there's your more standard ILT data set, which is uh, air quality data that's been collected from various sensors. Uh, this data set is actually kind of boring, so I'm going to pick one of these other data sets to uh, demo instead. Um, really, with device data or any activity stream, they tend to have a lot of commonalities, which is, uh, as I previously mentioned, a set of attributes that describe an event and a set of measurements. So uh, what I'm trying to showcase here is uh, edits on Wikipedia. Um, every time someone makes an edit on Wikipedia, there's an event that gets generated. And I actually collected these events and, and put them into a UI uh, just to showcase some of the workflows that, that you can do. Um, so there's, there's edit, there's attributes around the edit, like the page being edited, the time the edit occurred, uh, the user doing the edit. And then there's your measurements, which are the number of edits, uh, the number of characters added, deleted, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, what I mentioned with most time what you want to do with this data is you want to filter it in some way or you want to group on the attributes in some way to get some interesting information. So right now we're looking at the last, uh, no, let's look at the last seven days. There are about 2.8 million edits on Wikipedia with about 1.1 billion characters added and 37 million characters deleted. So if we want to look at 
uh, how these edits were trending across time, we can do that. And maybe we just want to pick some arbitrary time range here. Uh, if we want to look at the top pages being edited, that might provide some interesting insight. And we see that there's a lot of different types of stuff you can edit on Wikipedia. Uh, maybe we just want to filter out, filter on the articles being edited. Uh, so in this arbitrary range in time that we picked, we see deaths in 2017 is pretty, uh, pretty prominent up here. Uh, with Championship League, um, North Korean dictators, and, and, and DeMarcus Cousins from the NBA. So uh, maybe we want to break this down and understand a little bit better of, hey, who are the top users uh, making some of these edits? Uh, we can do that. Uh, for deaths in 2017, for example, uh, you know, this particular person has been doing a lot of edits for this you know, arbitrary range in time that we selected. And maybe we want to go a little bit further in our analysis, like we want to filter out those types of people who are not bots, uh, for example. So we can look at all those users who are not bots. Uh, and this one particular user here, editing deaths in 2017, doesn't seem like he's a bot. Maybe we want to look at, uh, for this particular user, what other pages they're editing over the span of time. And it seems like this is the only one they're editing. And um, yeah, so, so this, this type of workflow I'm trying to demonstrate of taking an event stream, uh, basically breaking it down, grouping it, filtering it, trying to expose insights, uh, trying to look at various metrics. Uh, this is something very common that you do with really any activity stream. And for the end user, uh, most of the time they access this data either through some command line or through some sort of UI or application. So when we're going about trying to make sense of a lot of uh, IoT data, uh, I think there's a couple of different problems to solve. Um, obviously, when there's a very small amount of data, when there's a low volume of data, uh, problems are very easy. And, and you, know, you don't see a whole lot of talks describing various technologies to use. Um, but with IoT data, with device data, uh, especially with the current growth of data, uh, even seemingly s trivial problems when you have a small scale of data be can become very difficult when you have a very large event stream. So I think there's three main problems um, that people generally try and solve. Uh, the first is around event delivering. So when some event gets generated by a device or, or f as part of some activity stream, you have to deliver it from where it is created uh, to some place where it can be consumed and analyzed. And just getting a, an event from one place to another uh, at a very large scale can be a pretty difficult problem. Uh, the second problem that you face when dealing with large volumes of event streams is around processing the events. Uh, raw data is oftentimes not very useful. Uh, there's a lot of imperfections in it. There's a lot of caveats to working with raw data. So to make that data useful and a little bit more consumable by analysts and users and whatnot, you generally have to process the event. So either cleaning it, adding business logic, potentially transforming it in some way. And then the third problem is uh, just taking, taking this process data and then making it available, uh, making it available for queries, making it available for applications so people can analyze and, and gain insights from it. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I think each of, these, each of these problems is very difficult. And uh, it's very difficult to find a single sort of solution that will solve all three of these problems. Uh, so for this talk, I'm really going to talk about three separate systems and why I think they're, they're particularly good at solving one of these problems. Um, so in, in, the, in the model I described, um, how it's kind of looking out right now is basically you have uh, data getting emitted from devices or activity streams. And at, at the end of the day, you want to have applications or users making use of this data. And in between, uh, I, I've kind of broken down the problems into three main pieces. Uh, the first is delivery, the second is processing, and the third is querying. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about data delivery. And this is the problem of getting events from where they're produced uh, to something that can consume them and, and do something further with them. Uh, so on one side of the delivery system, you have a set of data producers. And on the other side, you have a set of data consumers. Uh, there's a couple of different problems associated with data del delivery at scale. The most of them can can, uh, most of them are related to having high availability in the face of different types of failures. 
and also having a very fast and scalable system to deal with high volumes of events. Uh, fa failures can occur for a variety of reasons. So for example, if your network is out, is, is out uh, how do you prevent events from being dropped? Uh, if the thing that's consuming the data completely fails, uh, how do you ensure that events are still getting delivered into your systems? Um, what happens when you want to have multiple data consumers? So for example, if you have some very high critical data set, maybe you want many, many different systems to get access to that data. And at scale, these can all be pretty difficult problems. Um, thankfully, I think there's a pretty good open source system uh, called Apache Kafka, uh, which is very good at dealing with the data delivery problem. And nowadays, I think Apache Kafka uh, is really, has really become the open source standard for this problem. Uh, if you've never heard of Kafka before, it's, uh, it was initially built and open sourced at LinkedIn. And since then, it's, it's the open source movement has grown very rapidly. Uh, so there's many companies using it to handle uh, vast amounts of activity streams. Um, so the way that Kafka works is there's a notion of producers and consumers. And Kafka comes with a producer library that you can basically embed as part of your application or as part of the thing that produces data. And then it has a consumer library that you can use to basically pull data from Kafka. Uh, and in between, there is a set of Kafka brokers, and the brokers are going to store events as uh, stored in a distributed message log or message queue. Uh, so the idea is producers will uh, write events to these uh, distributed logs, and events are grouped logically as part of a topic. So a topic is like a table and a data source. It's, it's some grouping of events. Um, Kafka is a distributed system, so it's designed to run across many, many servers. And producers basically uh, write events, and these events get spread across uh, different partitions across different servers. And you can have consumers then pull the data uh, from, from these uh, partitions and read them and do something interesting with them. Uh, what's kind of different about Kafka is that uh, the consumers, um, they are responsible for basically maintaining information about which messages they've read. Um, so Kafka itself doesn't keep track of where a consumer has read messages to. Uh, so in that sense, it's very low overhead to add many, many consumers of the data. Uh, all Kafka does, very simply, is just buffers data and allows a bunch of different consumers to, to read that data. So uh, Kafka. Sort of as a summary, it's a high throughput event delivery system. Uh, it provides at least once delivery guarantees, which means if you send an event, if you produce an event and you transmit it, uh, it's, it's guaranteed to be delivered. Uh, it might be delivered more than once, like you might get a duplicate event here or there, um, but it will be delivered. And I know the Kafka folks are working towards uh, having exactly once delivery of events, which is a very, very difficult problem with streams. It uh, has a very simple, straightforward design. Uh, it's basically just to distribute a log that you write events to. And its main purpose is to buffer incoming data so consumers have time to consume it. Uh, in this model, you have a logical separation between things that produce data and then things that consume it. So if these guys all fail, uh, the producers can still write data to this intermediate buffer. And uh, if, if a consumer comes back online, it can read messages from any particular offset uh, in these different in these different buffers. So uh, Kafka, I think, is really great just for getting events from one place to another. Uh, the piece, I think, makes a lot of sense after Kafka is a stream processing piece. And the pur purpose of stream processing is uh, really to transform or modify raw data in such a way that it's more easily consumable by systems. So raw data oftentimes has many imperfections. It might have null values. It might have just random IDs that you need to replace with human readable strings. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you have to do with raw data before it's usable. And these stream processing systems, uh, what they're designed to do is take a stream of events and then transform it in some way. Um, so in the open source world, there are many, actually many, many different types of stream processors. Uh, they all have various trade-offs. Um, I'm not going to go into details about how, what, how all of them work. I'm just going to focus on their high-level idea. Uh, but different stream processors that are out there, uh, Spark Streaming, 
Apache Flink, Apache Storm, Apache Apex. Uh, there's Apache Samza as well. There's Kafka streams, and it and, uh, seems like more and more are coming up every other day. Um, the main challenges uh, that involve processing a stream, transforming the data of a stream, uh, like any, any system dealing with a high volume of data, uh, the system needs to be highly available in the face of different types of failures. It also needs to be pretty scalable, so be able to handle massive event streams and do something interesting with them. Um, the way that most stream processors work is that you transform data in a series of stages because uh, it's, it's actually very difficult to have sort of one big job to take your raw data and make it something useful. Uh, so instead, you have many small jobs, and each of them modify the stream in, in a different way. So the uh, stream processing system, I, I've used a couple of, different, uh, couple of different types of stream processors, but the one I like the best architecturally is Apache SAMHSA. Uh, Apache SAMHSA also uh, was first developed and open sourced by LinkedIn, and, and it's, a, it's probably a little bit less popular than, than Spark and some of the others, but I think architecturally it has some really nice properties. So the way that uh, SAMHSA works is basically you have an input stream of data, and this could be data in Kafka. Uh, SAMHSA then pulls that data and then uh, applies a series of transforms on it, and these transformations are called tasks. And it's up to the user to basically write the logic for a task, task to do something interesting with the stream. Um, so you can have uh, the same stream go to multiple tasks and have more than one task write to an output stream. And this output stream might be stored in a, in a system like Kafka as well. And as opposed to one transform task, you might have a series of tasks that, that modify the stream in different ways. And later on in the talk, I'll give you an example of this. Um, for like a real world application. So the way that uh, SAMHSA basically works is it breaks up processing logic uh, into a bunch of logical stages or tasks. And what's really nice about SAMHSA is that uh, for each of the tasks that you write to process the data, you can, you can tune different resource requirements. So certain tasks involving simple operations don't require a lot of resources, tasks require Tasks that do more complex things, more complex transforms of the data, uh, might require uh, much more resource requirements. And uh, in that sense, I think SAMHSA has really nice operational properties for transforming data. So the third and kind of final piece uh, I want to talk about here is, OK, you've taken your data from where it's created. You've delivered it, you've transformed it, you've done something interesting with it, and now uh, you want to go about and query it. So the querying system uh, is probably has the most complex requirements and also probably has the most uh, number of different choices that you can use. Um, so usually what I see people do with uh, a very large stream of data uh, is they want to be able to issue very interactive queries. So if you're accessing this data through an application, uh, if you're kind of slicing and dicing the data, you generally want queries to be very, very quickly. However, uh, the data might be very complex that prevents queries from completing quickly. So complexity of data might mean very high cardinality dimensions. So you might have uh, a dimension which has tens or thousands or even hundreds of millions of unique values, and sometimes you want to do operations across those values that, that, that can be very slow. Um, as, as I showed kind of earlier in my demo, uh, oftentimes you want to do ad hoc analysis. So when you're looking at a stream of data, you might not always know like what it is you're looking for. You might just be looking at a spike or a drop and trying to understand more about why that spike occurred, why that drop, drop occurred, uh, and trying to analyze the root cause of, of some pattern that you've seen. Uh, another challenge is uh, a lot of traditional querying systems, especially databases, uh, they, they tend to be more designed for batch loads and are, are a little bit less designed for loading a, a massive stream of, of potentially device data. And, and once again, of course, because we're dealing with very high volume event streams, high availability and scale are, are always kind of challenges in the background. Um, so, but I do think that once you're able to solve some of these challenges, uh, you can remove a lot of barriers for people to understanding their data. 
Uh, the reason why I think sub-second queries is very important, and, and not everyone might feel this way, but I think sub-second queries are very important to allow for iterative exploration of data. So you look at one view, you might see something interesting. Uh, you look at another view based on your, your, what you saw previously, and it's a very iterative process of like, asking questions, getting answers, asking more questions, and trying to rapidly iterate and find the root cause of a situation. So to accomplish uh, some of these challenges, uh, the third open source system I want to talk about here uh, is Druid. Uh, Druid is, is a system that I work on, so that's why I'm probably going to plug it the most during this talk. Um, so Druid is, is a, it's a column-oriented data store. And what, what that just means is uh, your data is stored individually in, in typed columns. So each column has a type associated, whether it's a string, it's a number, and so on and so forth. Uh, Druid is very much designed for sub-second ad hoc queries, and it supports both exact and approximate algorithms. And some of the approximate algorithms are there uh, to make certain workloads complete quicker. Uh, Druid is a system that's designed to work with other uh, streaming systems, so it works directly with uh, Kafka if you don't want need to process your data before you visualize it. Uh, it works with SAMSA and many other stream processors as, as well. So at the end of your stream processing job, you can feed that data into Druid. Um, Druid doesn't just deal with streams. It doesn't just deal with like recent incoming data. It can also keep years of historical data as well. So there's, there's a bunch of different companies that use Druid in production, uh, both large and small. So all right, moving on. So a uh, very high level uh, glance of how Druid works, uh, similar to some of the technical overview of the other systems. Uh, Druid partitions data uh, first based on time. And these time partitioned uh, shards are called segments. And these segments are actually immutable. So it's actually, Druid is a system very much designed to deal with a constant stream of events. Uh, Druid maintains a global index of basically time interval to shards. So each of the queries within Druid has a notion of time associated with it. And uh, so if you query for like a week's worth of data, that week's worth, that week's worth of data might uh, correspond to a couple of different shards. Uh, and Druid, Druid maintains an index of basically how different shards map to different time intervals. Uh, within each shard, uh, the data is stored in a column-oriented fashion and then compressed. Uh, this is similar to other column stores out there. And then each shard also contains a bunch of different types of indexes for very fast filtering. So there's, um, in, in this kind of demo I showed here, when you want to filter on whether or not uh, things are robots, uh, whether or not um, you want to do very fast groups, groupings, um, this demo is actually being powered by the stack I'm, I'm kind of talking about right now. Uh, one other nice property uh, about Druid is that it supports different types of approximate algorithms. So I think there's certain operations that you might want to do with an event stream. It's very difficult or very expensive to do exactly. Um, so for example, uh, for distinct count, if you want to count the number of unique device IDs, if you want to count the number of unique users, uh, having to store every single device ID or every single user ID is very, very expensive. Um, especially if you have now tens or hundreds of millions of users, it can be very expensive very quickly to store all that information just to do a distinct count. Uh, so there's a popular algorithm called hyperlog log. Uh, a lot of databases have this nowadays, but it allows for this estimation of distinct count with, with, without having to store every single unique ID. Uh, Druid also supports other approximation algorithms like uh, top n, which is an approximate ranking by a chosen measurement. Uh, it supports approximate histograms and quantiles. And it also supports approximate set operations, so you can do union, intersection, difference, uh, that sort of stuff with, uh, with Druid. Um, the architecture of the system looks basically something like this. Uh, the files part is not that interesting for this talk. Uh, the streams is really what we're focused on. So imagine that the, uh, the input of this is the output of a stream processor. Uh, what Druid does with the stream is it loads it across a set of processes called indexers. Uh, these guys will basically intake a stream. Uh, they will take that stream of data and then create these Druid shards, uh, which we call segments. And these segments are then loaded across a set of processes called historicals. 
the idea is indexers are only going to be dealing with a very small window of incoming data. So these guys only might deal with about an hour's worth of data, which they buffer up, uh, create these partitions, and hand off to the historicals. And these historicals deal with anything older than an hour up to like years um, of data. Yeah. yeah. So in the stream, can you define a, a data type as a container so that, for example, if, if, if a piece of data for me was, was an MPEG file off of a body cam or something like that, right. can you define that? Uh, so it varies from, from system to system, but like, uh, like in SAMHSA, for example, if I go back to here, each, each of the, the tasks here can be like containerized and they can run in a system like Mesos or uh, Kubernetes. Um, so basically, your, your processing logic, all of that lives within a container. Does that make sense? Well, I was thinking more, I think, in the Kafka model, you said that the columns, the, the columns were, were, uh, were typed, right? Uh, this, that's actually within Druid. Within Druid. Yeah. Uh, that has never been done. Most of the time, uh, one of the types is like an integer versus like a string versus uh, something else. If, if it was a container, um, I would have to think a little bit more if uh, how that makes sense. But usually the types are describing sort of the schema of the data, like what is the underlying data. Um, but like if one of the types was like MPEG, that might be something that's possible. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the workflows uh, described are a lot more around like statistical analysis. So like finding averages, means, aggregations, that sort of stuff off of a stream of data. Yeah. Um, but kind of just going to the last bit of the architecture here uh, within Druid. Uh, the idea of Druid is there's a third process called a broker. And these guys do query scatter gather functionality. So queries go to the broker. Uh, the broker fans out queries either to the indexers or the historicals. And these guys hold recent incoming data, and these guys hold historical data. Uh, so the brokers uh, have uh, a merged view of both real-time and historical data. And that, that's what gets returned to a caller or to an application. So when you kind of put these three systems together, um, just kind of overview, then what you have is three separate open source systems uh, that are handling three separate problems uh, dealing with streaming data. So data comes in, it goes to Kafka. Uh, Kafka can actually deliver it to the processing piece, uh, which is SAMHSA. And uh, with SAMHSA, the very last stage of your data processing, you can tell SAMHSA basically to send the query uh, to Druid. Another way of doing it is at the end of processing data with SAMHSA, uh, you can write it back to Kafka, and then Druid can actually pull data from Kafka as well. Uh, Druid is a system that's designed to stream data from a lot of uh, these, other, these other streaming systems. Um, so I thought I'd maybe be interesting to kind of go through a real world example uh, to kind of cover you know, how, how this works in the real world. And uh, for this data set here, I actually did not use IoT data. Uh, I used uh, data that's, that's kind of more commonly found in my field, uh, which is advertising data, because like about half the companies in Silicon Valley uh, basically make money through data that looks like this. Um, but with this data, uh, there's, there's two kind of data streams here. There's an impression stream, and then there's a click stream. And impressions, for those of you that aren't familiar with advertising, are basically people viewing an ad, and then clicks are just people clicking an ad. And what we want to do with this data through the stack that we've built up is basically create enhanced impressions, uh, which basically means for a given impression, we want to know, did someone click on this impression or not? Uh, so there's a couple of different steps required to, to process the data and get it in such a way that it's a little bit more usable. Uh, the first step that we want to do is to be able to join our impression stream with our click stream. Uh, with a traditional database, you would be able to do this join at query time. Uh, however, because we're dealing with like massive event streams, uh, th these might be billions or trillions of events, and trying to do that join at query time can be extremely, extremely expensive. So we're going to do this join uh, at, at our stream processing level. Um, and then after that, there's going to be a couple of different steps to basically clean up the data and just make it a little bit more user friendly before we load it into our querying system. So uh, the idea is uh, this impression stream and this click stream. Uh, this is server log data that might get generated to servers. 
uh, we first write this data into two separate topics in Kafka. So one topic is called impressions, and one topic is, uh, is called clicks. And, and this is just coming from our, our ad servers, for example. And we want to take this data, we want to enhance it, make it into a single stream, and then make it visible in Druid. <clears throat> Uh, the raw data looks something like this. Uh, so your impression stream, you have an ID of some ad, you have a publisher where that ad was published, and then your stream is divided into a set of partitions. And uh, if you recall what I said about Kafka, Kafka partitions data across many different servers. So we have many different partitions that contain our impression stream and also our, our click stream as well. And the event that we want to join uh, is are these two events. So one is someone viewing an ad, and one is sometime later someone clicking an ad. Uh, so this is where our stream processor comes in. And what our stream processor does is it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a series of jobs to be able to uh, join these streams. Uh, the first stage is a, a, a task called the shuffle step. And it's, the shuffle step is going to load data from the impressions and click stream. The idea of the shuffle step is basically to rework data in the partitions such that uh, the, the join events are going to end up in the same partition, because this makes it actually possible for us to do a join later on. Uh, so we do a shuffle where the impression and the click that we want to join are now both in the partition zero. And at the end of the shuffle phase, uh, basically we're going to write an, another stream to Kafka, and this is going to be the, the shuffle topic. So now we're, we're at three topics. Uh, the purpose of the, the shuffle topic is that we're going to create another job in SAMHSA, which is going to read from the shuffle topic and basically do something with it and then write it back to Kafka uh, to create this new topic called the join topic. Um, what, what's happening is, well, previously we want to join these two events. We do the actual join by basically removing one of these events, in this case the clicked event, and then adding a new field to our impression event, and that field is is clicked. Uh, so the idea is now there's a new, new field called is clicked, and if a join occurred, we mark that as true. If it did not occur, we mark it as false. And events that are joined are, that are then written to Kafka uh, under this new topic called joined, and after that, uh, we take this join stream and we can do additional tasks. We can do additional processing on top of that join stream. So we might add additional business logic, like let's replace the nulls with a default value. Uh, let's take IDs and convert them into human readable strings. And then that single stream is the thing that ultimately gets pushed into Druid. And that's what, uh, and then the queries and applications all go through Druid. So to kind of summarize here, uh, all the technologies I talked about, all these things are all open source. Uh, each of these projects have their own project web pages. You can just download any of these projects. Uh, the three I talked about kind of work out of the box with one another. So you can download these things, you can install them, you can play with it, uh, load your own event streams, and try things out for yourself. Uh, okay, so I, what I hope you actually got out of this talk is that I think managing IoT data requires dedicated components um, that are targeted towards solving very, very specific problems. And the three problems I talked about, one is data delivery, uh, the second is data processing, and the third is queries, a system for queries. And I think Kafka, Apache Kafka is, is a great system for event delivery. I think Apache SAMHSA is a very useful system for stream processing. And I think Druid is one of the best in class systems for the interactive exploration of streams. Cool, so that concludes my talk, and i um, happy to just answer any questions at this time. Yes? Um, so machine learning is pretty hot these days. It is, yeah. Have you seen any application of this in uh, to feed a, a machine learning? You know, it, I mean, it's essentially would be like multivariate time series data type. Yeah, um, definitely. So I have... Yeah, it is. Uh, so I actually have seen applications of, of this stack. I mean, this stack is run in production at a whole bunch of different types of companies. Uh, I have seen uh, application machine learning at, at some companies. I'm not sure if I can say their name or not. Um, but one of the use cases I've heard about is like just like behavioral analytics. So let's say if you have customers using like 20 different products and you want to start doing correlations across like the 
uh, di across different data sources, understanding how one customer is using one product and another product and a third product, and are these like all the same customers or not? What kind of like what? How are they using the the, the different products my company offers? Uh, that's one application of machine learning uh, that I've seen. So specifically, the area that I was driving towards is narrower than that. So. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's traditionally historical, maybe daily, maybe. Right. maybe in some cases hourly, but in an IoT world, you might want to be driving alerts, and so it's literally real time. Yeah. Then going back and doing historical, which is closer to what you're doing. So that was what I was getting at. If you've seen this used where you say, snap your window to show me everything that's happened in the last, you know, uh, 90 seconds. Yeah, so. That's what you're driving off to as an alarm, and as soon as the alarm's hit, then show me everything that's happened over the hour or find patterns. How many times has this happened in the last 24 hours? And literally run it through a, a machine learning algorithm to find a pattern. Right. Uh, so, yeah, with regards to the application of machine learning to this, uh, so the stack I, I described, it's all for real time data. Uh, the latency from when the event is produced to when it's explorable is like millisecond. Uh, so it is all very low latency. Uh, the stack I described uh, actually does both the streaming real-time component and also the historical component. And that alert piece is something I have seen before. Uh, how it usually works is uh, people try to automate like spike detection or anomaly detection. Uh, the best way I've seen that being done uh, outside of like human intervention, like there's always a thing of like alert me if X value exceeds like Y's threshold. Uh, that's a lot less interesting than some of the applications which is uh, let's take all my historical data and then compare what's happening in the last like 90 seconds with all that historical data. And if one of some factor is a significant amount above like what I've seen historically, and then immediately alert. Uh, there's interesting challenges there because a lot of data patterns can be like sinusoidal, like the middle of the day can be very different than the end of the day. So, and then like the end of a quarter can be very different than like the beginning of a quarter. Um, but that, that's why I think it's actually important to have the historical piece there so you can, you can look back like last five quarters and, and say like, is, is this actually anomaly or not? Um, but I've seen like pretty interesting work being done there and trying to automate like anomaly detection. Yes? It is being used uh, at DevOps. So both actually alerting and uh, a lot of sort of solutions designed for IoT make a lot of sense in the DevOps world. Uh, so one example of why I think the stack is pretty good is that it can do like very flexible ad hoc slice and dice analytics. Um, and the application of that is when you see like a weird spike in, in your DevOps data, then the most immediate thing is like what's causing that spike. And it might not be immediately obvious what's causing it. You need to like kind of break down your data and view it from a lot of different views before you find like the cause of that spike. Yeah, correlating that with some of the other data. Exactly. Right. Uh, cool. Right. Cool. Any other questions? Could you flesh out your demo example on GitHub or anything? I did. Uh, there is actually an example here uh, for GitHub. There's a uh, US EPA, which is your classic sensor data, and then I've been loading uh, GitHub events as well. So you can start looking at, uh, for example, top. This is these are all open source GitHub uh, events. But let me see if my. Oh man, is the display not? Well, let me unplug it and try and plug it back in. <laughs> Man, some, some, okay, so uh, this is this is uh, GitHub data actually I've been loading. So what I'm showcasing right now is let's say last seven days, uh, who are the top organizations that have been uh, contributing to open source GitHub, and uh, I mean Microsoft, the Apache Software Foundation are are very high up here. Uh, you can break this down by different types of repositories as well. So, um, so Kubernetes is here, Google, Facebook, they're all, they're all pretty big uh, contributors to GitHub. But you know, taking an, an activity stream from GitHub and like analyzing and breaking it down I think is, is pretty interesting. So here you can see Microsoft over the last week has been looking at VS Code, AirSlim, TypeScript, uh, Apache, the top Apache projects, here's Kafka, uh, here's Spark, here's Flink. Uh, these are, this is a stream processor. This is a batch and stream processor, and it can do some other stuff. And this is your event delivery piece. And so this this query set uh, mm -hmm. goes to that stack you just showed us. Yeah. The logic that is implementing that is that also a project that you have open on GitHub? 
Uh, the UI or the, the logic? Oh, to... in my, the UI and the um, SAMHSA. So SAMHSA is open. It's under the Apache uh, Software Foundation. Uh, the business logic you use to do like shuffle. Oh, uh, the logic of that. So most of the time, the organization uh, that's loading these things writes them themselves. I think SAMHSA and some of these other stream processors probably have some like default ones that come out of the box. Um, but uh, yeah, oftentimes it's like custom custom business logic that, that the organization then writes. I mean, this, this UI is your SAS that you've written on top of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, but underneath the this is just an example UI, but underneath the seams, it's the same stack. Um, so this is just like some pretty interesting stuff that you can do this. So if you want to look at like the Apache Software Foundation, um, you can do that. You want to look at you know Apache Kafka, for example, and look at who's who's kind of contributing to Apache Kafka. These, these, oh, I know this person. I don't know who the other people are, but <laughs> uh, this is kind of kind of an example of how you can start analyzing and slicing and dicing like what people are doing on GitHub, um, and it's a good way of, of following like what are popular open source projects. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Is your deck uh, uploaded? I'm not sure. I have to send it to I have to send it to people. Yeah, but definitely I will upload it, and it has some information. I'll, I'll, everything I talked about is open source. You can download it. And as I mentioned, even like hooking uh, components up from one another, all that is should work out of the box. Cool. Uh, other questions? All right. Thanks, guys.